Hey everybody, today Rotto rounds up the month of July 2019, which is a tricky, tricky month for me because I've been flying solo for the last four weeks. My wife, Jen, she went to the UK with most of her family and has been having a great time, but she left me here alone to take care of the dogs and the chickens and still play games and film them for you. And so, since my only gaming partner was gone, I had to switch into my solo summer mode. Which means, of the 22 games I'm about to talk about, 19 of them I have only played as a solo game. And, like always, I'm going to do a countdown from my least favorite to my most favorite, but I'm judging them based on the solo experience they provide. Now, if I were to have played these multiplayer with Jen, chances are the uh, countdown would have shuffled around a little bit. Now, I might mention that a little bit uh, here and there, but... Um, like I said, this is my solo summer, all solo, all the time, except for three games that I can't quite claim that. Because they either didn't have solo rules, so I had to emulate a multiplayer game, um, you know, and just pretend I was playing with Jen, even though she wasn't here. In one case, I did actually play with one other person. Let's get those three out of the way, and then we'll get to the solo countdown. Sound good? All right, so these three I am not ranking because I, I played them as multiplayer. We'll get to the solo in a second. But first of all, let's talk about Raid on Takao which is the sequel to the excellent Raid on Taioku, which was a cooperative game I covered a few years ago. This sequel does everything uh, Taioku did, but builds on it in such amazing, powerful ways. I was super impressed by this. Now, it is a cooperative game, and so like all cooperative games, you can always play them solo. You just have to take on the role of multiple players, which is what I did. And... Um, what is the situation? This is basically set in uh, Taiwan, World War II, during the bombing runs uh, that America was, you know, just completely pummeling this island nation, trying to drive out the Japanese and all that. And oh man. Like Taioka before it, this game is brilliant more than anything else because it does not cast you in the role of some brave um, you know, hero or something like that that's going to save the day or fight back against the uh, onslaught. We're just regular people trying to survive in these really horrific circumstances. And... Um, the, the strength, more than anything else, of Taioku... Because oh, it was a good, solid, pandemic-esque cooperative game where you travel around the board, try to complete objectives, you have limited actions you can do. Ta uh, Takao is the same, but they have really doubled down on the relationship element between players. Um, if you ever played Pandemic... Legacy Season 1, or if you saw my video for it, you know I was super, I was a huge fan of the relationship elements between players. Uh, that how, oh yeah, look, we're siblings, and that has an actual gameplay meaning. That definitely happens here, because there are eight different characters you can play, um, and uh, they know, uh, most of them know each other. It's fathers and sons, and husbands and wives, and, and, and family, friends, and all that. Although not all characters know everybody else. And depending on the combination of characters you bring into the game, you, each character is going to have their own specific goals they're trying to achieve that are either tied to their friends and family who might be playing the game with them. But if they're playing with a group of strangers, and yet they still have to work together, then they get their own personal inward goals instead of their outer goals. Um, if the mother is playing with her son, her main goal is to stay with her son no matter what, which can be very, very challenging to do because you have to split up and get stuff done. Um, if the mother isn't playing with her son and is playing with the reporter, um, then she has her own goals instead about having to get to certain places in the city. So you've got those goals that are are really relatable. They are tied to who these people are. And by the way, um, these different characters all have different special abilities, like a good pandemic game, so it's compelling to try and mix and match them, not only because of their objectives and how they play out, but also just the special powers they've got. Um, but in addition to that, the game comes with five scenarios, and each time you play, you pick a scenario. These are all based on historical, real-world events, and um, you have to complete this common goal and your own personal goals. Now, the common goal you must do to win. If you don't complete your personal goals. You'll get three of them uh, drip-fed to you over the course of the game. If you can't complete them, if you fail, you get a morale hit and you get like a little um, impact, you know, like a slight bonus. Because you've just, if you've survived, you get better at stuff. But if you can complete your own personal goal while still working towards the common goal, you can get a big bonus that really helps. The tension between focusing on myself versus focusing on this main goal, like saving zoo animals that have escaped and are going to get killed and trying to maneuver them to safety, even though they've got a mind of their own and 
won't necessarily do what you want to do. Or um, avoiding secret police. All kinds of different things. You got to focus on that, but you have to focus on your own private goals as well. And the tension between those is really lovely. And on top of all that, I mean, that those are all huge improvements on the basics of what Taioku did. But the um, the external forces, the bombing, the way that works is much more predictable. So it can really be a big part of your overall strategizing. I just got to say, folks, Raid on uh, Takao was super impressive. It shows designers building on their strengths, creating something even better. And, you know, I honestly, I feel more enriched for having played it. I mean, and that's not something you can often say about board games. This is an important game that tells an important chapter of history that is largely forgotten or overlooked. And I was very impressed by Raid on Takao. After that, we've got Dice Throne Adventures, which is actually does have solo rules. And I begged the publisher, please give me the solo rules, because this is a game that's on Kickstarter right now, which, by the way, meant it was a paid preview I did for it. Um, so bear that in mind. When I, um, I, I talked to them, they uh, sent me the cooperative rules because, I should say, Dice Throne Adventures, which is on Kickstarter right now, still, the campaign is going on, takes the hugely popular dueling uh, fantasy Yahtzee-style uh, game, basically Yahtzee meets Magic the Gathering, Dice Throne is what that game is called, takes it and turns it into a cooperative dungeon crawl. And um, when I originally signed up for it, I thought, oh, they'd be able to send me the solo rules because I knew they had them. And it turns out they didn't have the solo rules in place yet, which I was really bummed because I really wanted to see them. But, so, I had to emulate a two-player game, like I did with Takao. And um, I had a blast doing it. This is a very, very sharp game. And you can watch my run-through, my incredibly long run-through, to see why. But, uh, you know, the main thing is, the core of Dice Thrones, which is immensely popular, this wonderfully produced game, is just gorgeous, with wonderful, wonderful dice. The melding of Yahtzee, roll, re-roll, re-roll, special custom dice to, to charge up for powers that you can then launch at your opponent. Now that you can launch, uh, we can both work cooperatively to launch them against enemies in the world as we explore and save up for a big boss, but we're racing against the clock because the longer it takes us to get to the boss, the more powerful he gets is really, really good. And I had a really great time. Apologies if you go watch my run through. Uh, it was a bit more laden with um, errors most than most. I think in part because I didn't get a chance to play it with Jen, would have helped like solidify my brain a little bit more. But um, yeah, it's very, very impressive. Uh, if you like dungeon crawls and you like rolling lots of dice, but not just roll to resolve, roll to use, then um, Dice Stone Adventures might be worth looking at. And then the third game I did not play alone, I actually did play with somebody else. King Domino Duel is the two-player only sequel to King Domino. And uh, I, I, there was no way I, I could play, but I really, really wanted to. So I reached out to Paul Grogan of Gaming Rules, which is another YouTube channel. Uh, he does phenomenal uh, teach how to play videos. He actually does a bunch of stuff. He does reviews, he does uh, blogs and uh, vlogs and all kinds of stuff. And he's just a really great guy. He's a professional rules writer in the industry and then he also does this channel on the side. And you know, I've known him for a few years and we were chatting and I said, man, I really wish I had somebody to play King Domino Duel with. And he said, well, play it with me. Um, because this is, like I said, it's a two player only a variation on King Domino, and after we played it, both Paul and I agreed, we think it's better than the original King Domino. And that's saying something, because King Domino was a Spiel of the Year nominee. Did it actually win? I don't remember if it won, but King Domino was a hugely well-loved, uh, kind of gateway style, lay, you know, drafting for dominoes and then laying them to build your own little city. Now, we're rolling dice and drafting those. After I get two dice in the draft, I snap them together to create a custom domino that I use to expand the city, and it's so good. Uh, I had a great time playing with Paul, um, even though he was in England and I was here in, in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, so that did make playing a little bit tricky, and that may explain somewhat the outcome. But still, we both had a great time, and I was super duper impressed, and I cannot wait for Jen to get back. Uh, because this is effectively a roll and write, and I think it's one of the better roll and writes out there. It's probably going to have to go into my top five roll and writes of all time whenever I get around to updating that top ten list. Super duper impressed. Bye. King Domino Duel. Okay, so that's it, folks. We are now ready for the countdown. Are you ready? Okay. All solo, all the time from here on in, starting with number 19, Talisman Legendary Tales. And I'll be honest, the reason I ended up getting this, when the publisher reached out and said, hey, do you want to cover this? And I'm like, well, you know what? I've heard about Talisman uh, forever. 
But I have zero desire to play it, because as I understand it, Talisman is an epically long three or four hour roll and move fantasy game that everybody has fond nostalgic memories from their childhood. I never played it in my childhood, and so I've never really been interested in playing it. But it's it's so well loved, I've almost kind of felt like I'm missing out. Like I, I can't really consider myself a well-rounded connoisseur of modern games if I haven't played this thing that is so influential to so many people. And when I saw, oh, they've released Legendary Tales. It's a cooperative version of Talisman. Yes! Bring it on! I'll give it a try. And then when it got here, only then did I discover it. it's Talisman in name only. It's a very radically different game. The, co the central construct of Talisman, is, which is a roll and move game, is you roll the dice and all you get to do is decide to go clockwise or counterclockwise because you're going to decide one of the two places and that's where the the crux of decision making is. And I, and I actually I think that's actually a really interesting core. It's kind of what uh, Feld's Merlin does, uh, but to greater effect. And I thought, okay, cool. I'll get to see this as a uh, cooperative instead of a competitive game, but that's barely in the game at all. It is still a roll and move. You roll to see how far you can move, but if you roll a three, you can move one, two, or three spaces. You're not bound. You must move a three. So that central tension of, I didn't get what I want. What am I going to do? What am I going to, what, what fallback position am I going to take? Because I still have to make a choice for one or the other. Do I move towards a thing that I really want and hope to roll, or do I forget it? I'm going to go in the other direction and trade for other stuff. I like that idea. That's completely gone from Legendary Tales. Instead, it is a multi chapter uh, campaign game where you still roll to move around, but when you fight bad guys, you um, do a bit of bag building. Everybody has their own private bag full of chips that are tied to who their character is, and you try to draw the chips you need to defeat the monsters you fight along the way, or do tasks and whatnot. Pretty simple stuff. In fact, when I say simple, I mean really simple. This game is clearly designed to be my first adventure game for kids. If you are a diehard um, lover of fantasy adventure board games, and you have have very young children, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can't judge, seven or, or, or younger, this would be a great way to introduce them. Because I'm not saying it's a bad game. It is a well-designed game. But really, only if you're going to be playing with kids who have not, um, who, are, who, who would like to introduce to complex concepts like bag building. Um, you know, as you pull stuff out, you know the stuff that's still in there and you can make informed decisions based on what you think is going to happen. Being able to build that bag by putting new and interesting things. Uh, you know, that's really the central crux. And I love bag building, but it's so lightweight here. It just does not have enough. I will say one thing. So I only played this solo and I thought, well, okay, that'd be interesting. The weird thing is they did zero work on trying to balance or scale the game for different player counts. It plays exactly the same. And I found, even though I'm playing solo, you think, oh, I got to do everything by myself. I, gotta, I, I still found it to be a pretty easy game. So that just goes to show, this is designed to be played uh, as a full family, three or four players um, with young kids, so you can introduce them to these ideas. And I think for that, it does very well. That is not what I wanted, which is why Talisman Legendary Tales is at the top of the list. All righty, let's move on to something... I liked a little bit more the Grizzled Armistice Edition. Now, I've actually covered the Grizzled years ago. And the, it's interesting, Grizzard, Grizzled is a, well, heck, like Great Unto Cow, it's another game that is, I think, an important work of board game art because it educates and informs and enlightens and enriches you by transporting you to another place and allowing you to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. In the Grizzled, the shoes you're walking in is uh, French soldiers in the trenches of World War One. And while that may sound horrific, um, it actually does a really great job of, instead of focusing on the horrors of war, focusing on the the best that humanity has to offer, our ability to work together to overcome insurmountable odds. That's always been an amazing thing about Grizzled, which is a cooperative, imperfect information game where we all have to play cards in turn, not being able to say what we have in our hands, so we have to intuit what we think other players will do, um, which is something I always really enjoy anyway. And um, the problem with the original Grizzled was, it was very, very cool, but the two-player rules were terrible. And um, but then the first expansion at your orders introduced a uh, the was it called the recruit uh, where if I play a two player game we have a third character recruit who we're both responsible cooperatively to keep alive and suddenly it became amazing so with Armistice Edition which is a phenomenal presentation it has these amazing miniatures that are absolutely gorgeous um, they they add so much to the tactile feel of the game even though they're 
really superfluous because they could just be a, a simple token that indicates whether you are withdrawn uh, from the front or not. They're, they're so gorgeous. And there are a lot of really cool new elements. Uh, this very interesting story campaign that allows you to live a life through World War One, going through all the different major historical events. Um, and But you surviving them and what kind of impact they have on you in terms of the missions you have to take, that is really well considered. Very well done. So... Um, and uh, the Grizzled always had a good uh, solo game, so I figured, oh, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna play it solo. I've never gotten to play it. I'm gonna. Um, and here's where I was disappointed. And here's why this should rate a lot higher because Grizzled is fantastic. And if I had played Grizzled as a three or a four or a five, or I think it goes up to six players now. I'm not sure about that. If I'd played it at a higher player count. I probably would rank this in the top ten, maybe even the top five. But the new two-player rules are super disappointing. The new two-player rules are almost as bad as the original two-player rules because the recruit that they introduced in At Your Orders was such a cool system, they have now worked it in to the core gameplay. So now you have to deal with recruits of varying types who have different special powers and, you know, they come and go and it's, you know, kind of the story of, of, of wartime camaraderie. Um, it works really, at least I can see from the description, it sounds really, really cool. But because they added that to the multiplayer game, they couldn't use it for the two-player game and they came up with a new two-player set of rules which are which require you to memorize. It becomes a memory game and I'm like, ah, this is horrible. Very disappointed by that. But, no big deal. I'm playing solo. So I'll get to see the uh, campaign story and all that. Here's the next complaint. The solo um, uh, variant for Grizzled Armistice Edition does not let you play through the campaign. Instead, you just basically, uh, it, it's like there is no campaign, you just take out all the cards, a lot of the new features that are in the game you don't get to use, and it's basically just the original solo game with just a tiny bit of extra content. So if you're only ever going to play Grizzled Solo, you might as well have just gotten the original one. Except for those awesome miniatures. So I gotta say, I mean, that's why this is ranking fairly low at number 18. Um, if I could play Grizzled at the higher player count, I think this would be amazing. Um, especially if you could play over multiple sessions with the same group and see the war play out in front of you from your own personal perspective instead of, you know, the perspective of generals. But both the solo and the two-player, I think, I think the Grizzled has been robbed a little bit. I'm really kind of disappointed by that. Um, so much so that, I mean, I would play the Grizzled plus at your orders over Grizzled Armistice. Although, man, those miniatures, they're so lovely. But anyway, that was number 18. Number 17 is Enchanter's Overlord the cooperative expansion or the cooperative act. Because I've already done a run through for Expansion's Overlord. My uh, wife and I have actually played uh, Enchanter's quite a bit. Um, and when the cooperative variant for the game came available if you use a smartphone app. I was like, over the moon. It was so good. Because um, finally, all the take that cards that always kind of bothered us, well, when you play cooperatively, they're not attacking each other. We're attacking a common foe. Um, you know, And it did a brilliant job. Much like Dice Throne Adventure did a brilliant job of taking a, a, a very in-your-face dueling game and turning it into a good co-op. The Enchanter's co-op variant, which requires a smartphone, at least right now, um, there will be physical cards to replace it later. Uh, is a great example of turning a competitive uh, dice or card drafting euro into a cooperative one. We were really impressed. Um, but I took the time this month to play it solo. Not only did I play it um, cooperatively with Jen last month before she went, but I played it solo this month. And I got to say, it's not as good. It's okay. It's brilliant as a co-op game with two or more players, which again, it would rate much, much higher. But as a solo game, not having another player to interact with, because so much about Enchanters is about interaction. And before, it was often negative interaction between players, but now it's all positive interaction between players. And for me, not to be able to help you building your enchantment or you helping mine, me just being entirely by itself, it worked, it was fine, but it was a real drop down, which is why, as a solo game, it rates lower. Again, as a cooperative game, it would rate very high indeed. But that's it for Enchanters Overlord Co-op, and you can go watch my run through to see more. Although I did uh, present it, the uh, I didn't. Pre I originally, it's funny. I did film it as a solo. I'm like, ah, oh, this is just showing that the solo isn't as good as it could be. And so I refilmed the whole thing as a co-op, so so players could really see just how good it could be. Anyway, that was number 17. Enchanters Overlord, the cooperative variant. Number 16 is Vudne Schlack, which is a 
very charming little gateway tile laying game all about trying to expand rivers um, by tile laying, um, you know, expanding upriver or downriver, placing sawmills downriver from actual lumber spots so that that lumber can travel downriver following the flow of the water to get to the sawmills to get me points, or can travel from the wheat fields down the river to the um, water mills so it can be converted into victory points. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and it's a sharp game. Uh, I did like it, but, uh, you know, I was a little disappointed because having played solo, it doesn't let you win necessarily. It does the solo trick of saying, oh, just play to the best of your ability and then compare your final score to a chart. And as good as the actual tile laying was, it don't get me wrong, it's very, very light. It's almost a lighter gateway than, uh, what do you call it, Carcassonne. If anything, it's maybe even lighter than Carcassonne. It's Carcassonne taking out a lot of the depth and complexity of how to place your meeples and replacing it with the notion that um, the roads, if you were to think of them that way, are they're all rivers and the water flows one way, so you're always trying to smartly build upriver or downriver. That's a cool puzzle. I did like that. Um, and I, I enjoyed the game overall. Um, but... It uh, in the solo mode where oh I, I, you know I get an A plus if I got eighteen points I, I get a B if I got fifteen points that was a little disappointing I would have liked to have seen some other metric uh, which is always the case in a solo game I just don't want to beat my high score that's not compelling to me and that's what really uh, held it back now the interesting thing is uh, Budne Slack I haven't played it as a multiplayer game yet but this is probably one of the most multiplayer solitaire games I've ever played because there is no there is literally zero interaction between players. Every turn, I just draw a tile randomly, place it somewhere on my board, and at the end of the game, I score. And if I scored more than you, great. If you scored more than me. So, it's fair. The solo game is actually being true to uh, what the competitive game is, but still, I would have liked to see something more. It's nice. It's super lightweight. I, like I said, I think this is maybe a better gateway for um, bringing complete novices in to the board game hobby than even Carcassonne because it's so simple and streamlined and any complex rules are all very intuitive because they all center around the flow of water. Okay, I got to put that lumber upstream from the lumber mill, but now that I put this lumber mill here, none of the, the, the other stuff is going to go further downstream and trying to puzzle everything out is really sharp. Um, I did enjoy it, just would have liked, I think I would have liked it more, multiplayer. Uh, that is number 16, a Vudne Schlack. Number 15 is Valley of the Kings Premium Edition. I'm very thirsty. Hold on a second, everybody. Ah, okay. So, I have covered every Valley of the Kings iteration that has ever come out. Well, the original one, and Last Rites, and the third one, or the second one. I forget what they're called. Um, but anyway, but, but, the interesting thing is, the Premium Edition takes all the previous one, uh, gives a huge graphic makeover. They are now tarot-sized cards instead of smaller, regular playing card styles. Uh, so the art really pops. The game looks so much better now. And um, into this Premium Edition, a bunch of new cards are thrown in, which is great. More variety is a good, good thing. And the other thing it adds... Because uh, Valley of the Kings is a phenomenal deck builder. Uh, deck building and deck destruction. As you're adding cards to your deck, trying to make it stronger and stronger like any deck builder, but you don't score anything unless you take the time to pull cards out of your deck to entomb them uh, because you're an Egyptian king trying to get in good for the afterlife. And that's always been the central tension of this game that's so sharp. I want to keep this in my deck because it's very powerful. But if I get rid of it, it's worth a lot of points. What to do? Sharp idea. It's always been great. Plus the, the way you draft with the crumbling pyramid. Neat, neat stuff. So, the original um, versions of Valley of the Kings had very simple solo rules that never really struck me as particularly interesting. They were, they were fine, but really no big deal. Nothing to write home about. But the new Premium Edition also included new solo rules that had you competing against a virtual opponent. You know, it's like what I was just talking about, um, uh, you know, in Wooden Age Slack, I, was, I would have liked a virtual opponent. Valley of the Kings produces a lovely, really, really good virtual opponent where, um, you know, I, every turn I'm just trying to build my deck. I, I play my game exactly as you always have. The opponent uh, basically just has a deck of cards, and every turn you draw a card, and that basically tells you one of the cards that they will end up drafting and scoring for themselves. So their, their turn is super simple. And they are a good, challenging uh, opponent to try to beat. Uh, because you know, I, I can see what they're going for. And often I can make choices. Oh, I can't let you get that. i got to get rid of that one because it's going to go in. Oh, and that'll be such a huge scoring thing for you. So it created a lot of interesting tension and was really, really good. 
Why didn't it rate higher? I'll tell you. Um, the rules for the solo game were very, very good. Very sharp, very well done. Uh, actually, they were originally done by uh, fans of the game on Board Game Geek, and the designer thought they were so good, he decided to make them official, and so they got credited. Really nice. I loved everything about it. But here's the thing. That deck that the dummy is drawing from is just a deck of the regular cards in the game. And um, so, you know, if, if you draw the... Oh, I, I can't think of what they are. If you, if you draw... Uh, not the Medic, the Medici, the, the, the Medici. If you draw this particular card, you have to... There are four different types of cards you can draw from their deck, which is four different types of actions they can do. And the problem is, there's nothing on the card to tell you what they do. Because they completely ignored the solo game in the production of this. I so wish on all of those cards, they just put a little icon down in the bottom corner of the card. Just a little out of the way. Uh, and they say, hey, if you're playing multiplayer, ignore this. This is only for the solo game. Because then, if I'm playing the solo game, I can draw the card, see that icon, and know what to do. I played like three full games of this. And even after three games, I was still having to write, okay, this is the card, that's the one that does this. And I was constantly having to double check a random page in the rule book. I wish they had just put a little bit more effort to put that information on the card. That would have been very, very nice. Or if not that, at least give us a nice rule summary card so I could just have uh, right next to the deck so I can say, oh, it's that one, oh, it's that one, because it got really kind of annoying. I was very disappointed by that, just like a, a, a you know a production gaffe. And what was otherwise a really excellent. I mean, if you're looking for a good solo deck builder that uh, creates an interesting challenge, to, um, you know, with a, with a good virtual opponent, you want to check this out. But you'll probably want to make your own cheat sheet for it eventually, because you won't have to constantly keep looking it up, uh, unless you play enough that you finally memorize what those four different actions are tied to the completely thematically disassociated regular multiplayer cards. That was really disappointing. This would have rated a lot higher if not for that one gaff that made the solo game a little bit more bitty than it needed to be. Plus, another problem was there was definitely an oversight because they transcribed the rules that were originally put as part of the variant on Board Game Geek directly into the new rulebook. Hardly made any changes at all, and that's a problem because the rules that were on Board Game Geek don't take into account some of the new cards that have been added to this version of the game. So when I was playing, like, but how does this card? What do you... And eventually, I, I had to go and talk to the publishers and ask them, right, I, I don't understand how does this work. This is my guess. Is this correct? That was a bit of a bummer. Um, it's great, but it just needed a little bit more work. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. Overall, Valley of the Kings is a phenomenal deck builder. This new presentation is awesome. Uh, it, it definitely kills the old individual ones, unless you're a stickler, you, you hate big cards. But I think the big cards are great. I mean, they're easier to read at a distance, because some of these cards have a lot of text. Just across the board, I'm very impressed, just with that one caveat about my number 15, Valley of the Kings Premium Edition. Then, on to number 14, Harbor. High Tides. Now, Harbor, when I did a run-through for it a billion years ago, I called um, uh, Tiny Epic Le Havre because it is from designer Scott Elms of the Tiny Epic series, although this is not actually associated with Tiny Epic at all. But it basically takes the gameplay of Le Havre, which is a worker placement game where you have one worker and they're constantly moving from one building to another, and um, I can move them to my own buildings and I can move them to your buildings, which means I have to benefit you if I want to use your building. Um, and it's all about you know playing a market and converting goods into other goods and, and, and building buildings. So it's like all of the big, huge Le Havre shrunk down to a little game. Jen and I were huge fans of Harbor. Although, at the time it came out, a lot of people were kind of meh on it because the market, which represents the value of cattle and um, well, lumber and stuff like that, is so volatile, some players say it's impossible to anticipate. And Jen and I didn't feel that way because you can anticipate what the market's going to do if you anticipate what your opponents are going to do. If you're paying attention, you can ride that wave. Oh, I know you're about to build that building, I bet, which means you're going to sell this, which means that's going to come up really high in value, and so I'm going to wait till after you're done, and then I'll build my thing. That's what Harbor is, and it's great. So... An expansion came out. I have not played it with Jen yet, but I did play it solo. Let's talk about the expansion first. It's very cool. It adds, I forget, something like 20 new buildings to build. And these are very, very cool. With new features like you build a building, you get to take an extra turn, all kinds of neat stuff. That was awesome. But even more important, it adds this new concept of ships, where instead of building a building, you can, um, for the same action... It's not really build a ship, but spend the resources to put them on a ship, and then you claim that ship. And what that does is, that allows you to ignore the volatile market. Because you can normally, um, you know, as the, as the value of things are changing all the time, and when you try to sell your stuff to build, you don't get changed, so it can often be a very painful and challenging thing to wrestle. Now, the, the, uh, the value of the ships is uh, never changing. And instead, you can always get a ship, which lets you kind of bank resources that you can wait and use later. It makes the game easier. 
I don't know if I'm a fan of that. It's fine. I think it's a big deal for people who really did not like the original hardware because of the volatility. So it's great for them. But honestly, I think I could take it or leave it. But the new buildings are awesome. And the other thing I should say is uh, I played it solo. The original game came with solo rules, so I finally tried them. And it is a good solo variant. It's all about another player who basically um, activates... You, you, he activates stuff, which means he blocks them for you, and you know he's he can make changes to the value of stuff in the market just like you can. You can anticipate what he's doing. It works really well. I was very impressed by it. Um, and it worked for the most part. It's weird. This is another case where... Um, the solo rules seem to be kind of an afterthought. Or with this expansion, they didn't say, well, hey, I mean, at nowhere in the new rules does it say what the the solo uh, opponent from the original game does with these ships. This whole new feature is added, and you don't know what to do with them. So I again, I had to contact the developer, and they said, yeah, you just he ignores that. And I'm like, ah. Uh, I don't know. Normally, I'm not a solo player. This month has definitely made me more aware of the trials and tribulations a solo gamer has to go through because it's often often done really well. Like I said, I think the solo player for Harbor was very good. He's a good opponent. But it was kind of a bummer that they weren't integrated as tightly as they could have been. Oh, and then the other thing, as much as I liked it, I thought it worked really well, I did think he was a little bit too easy. I think um, I would have liked to see with this expansion something to have made the variant, the, the dummy player, a little bit more of a challenge to beat. Um, because if you're if you're playing smart, you have so much information, you know exactly what he's going to do, and you can play him like a fiddle. You can't always do that with other players. Um, but still, I had a good time. And I do think High Tides is a very, very good expansion. Not perfect, or it adds some stuff I wouldn't necessarily want to use, because uh, it because it makes the game a little bit easier, less challenging. But overall, I had a good time with my number 14, Harbor High Tides. Now, number 13 is not a game. It is a coffee table book about board games called The Board Game Book. Um, and I'm ranking this because it was a solo activity I did this month. I basically spent an, a solid afternoon just sitting on the couch, uh, thumbing through this thing, looking at all the gorgeous pictures, um, and you know, reading uh, descriptions of a lot of games, I have to admit, I'd never heard of um, that sounded really interesting and intriguing. And I know about games. but you know, So it really uh, had a, a lot of interesting knowledge about games. But the thing I really enjoyed about this was, for a lot of the games, there were um, sometimes one, or, or there were often one or two pages interviews with the designers of those games. And, I mean, I read several of them that I thought were really, really good. I loved the interview with uh, Matt Leacock and Rob Davio talking not about Pandemic Legacy 1, but Pandemic Legacy 2. Uh, and, um, you know, the hurdles of trying to overcome how big a success it was and the challenges of trying to change up the formula, that was so much more interesting. You would have thought, hey, let's talk about your biggest thing in Season 1, but they said, nope, let's talk about Season 2. That was awesome. There was an interview with uh, Reiner Knizia, uh, where he kind of digs into his design process, which is uh, really fascinating. He talks about how he does very much care about the I media. Mean, I mean, it's like, whoa, whoa. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the book is designed to sit on your coffee table, and if you have friends over who don't play games, they might think, what's all this? This looks really interesting. This is intriguing. Uh, it's also a great gift. If you have people in your life who want to be gamers, but they don't know where to start, you can buy them this book, because it's full of really crackerjack advice. Depending on whether you're a new player, or an experienced player, or a hardcore player, what types of games you want. It talks about the history of games. But, even for... I don't need either of those. I don't, I don't even have a coffee table, and I don't have people come over who don't play games. Games. Um, I don't have people come over at all. So I don't need it for that. But then I was so surprised to see I still had a really great time. And it was an afternoon I spent not playing solo games for you, but just reading it for myself because I loved these interviews. Uh, it was really, really, it's a wonderful package. And it says it's volume one. So I hope we'll see more in the future of the board game book, my number 13. Then on to number 12, Nautilion. Now, this is um, one of two Oniverse games that are going to be on my list. I played both of them solo. And the Oniverse, which is a series of games from designer uh, Shady Torbe, are all set in this crazy, fantastical, surreal dream world. And every time a new Oniverse game comes out, it takes one central mechanism you know really well and does a beautiful job of turning it into a solo game and also a two-player cooperative game. Now, I've very rarely played them solo, but this time I played them solo because Jen wasn't here to play them with me. I read the rules for how they get turned into co-op, and it sounds like just as solid as ever. They did a good job, or Shady did a good job of making it work solo or multiplayer. The first one I played was Natillion. It comes in at number 12 um, because it's a brilliant game, 
Uh, it's a roll and move game where uh, every round, it's kind of roll and move crossed with Biblios, if, if that's a thing. Because you roll three dice, and then you give one to you, your little submarine that's trying to get to the evil uh, uh, enemy base and destroy it before the world is destroyed. You have to give another one of the three dice to the enemy sub that's trying to get to your home to destroy it. And we're both racing to get to the opposite side of this little randomly generated board. Um, and you give a third die to basically an event counter that will make certain things happen. So every round, it is a tough choice because as you're moving through this world to try to get to the uh, the, the alien... Uh, not the alien, the, the enemy fortress to destroy it before the other sub gets to your town and destroys it, you have to pick up certain crew members which means you have to land on certain spaces. Um, so you're always waiting. And you're rolling three dice, so it shouldn't be that hard to be able to land on those spaces, right? Here's the problem. Often you're like, oh, I need this two for myself because that'll get me the sailor I need. But that means I got to give a six or a five to the enemy sub, which means he's traveling twice as fast as me. Ah, oh, what am I going to do? It's really cool. It doesn't rate higher because... Here's the one thing I was surprised. I, I definitely enjoyed it. But... All of the Oniverse games come with usually a half a dozen different variants you can throw in to add special powers and different objectives and all kinds of fun stuff. And normally, I've found that you you play it you play the game once and then every time you play, you mix and match a couple of the of the modules, so you get a different game every time. This one, the core game is so light, and it wasn't really if if only the core game were there, it would have rated much lower. It was a good game. What I just described, uh, the you know the the. Uh, I split, you choose, or I split, I choose, dice rolling, movement thing, was really good. But it was so featherweight that I found to make it an engaging game, a solo game, I had to play with all of the modules turned on. And then when I did, it was fantastic. Um, and I had a great time. But uh, it's kind of a bummer, because like I said, I like Oniverse games where I just mix and match, and every time I just play with a couple of the different missions. Uh, it's Don't get me wrong, it's great. I had a great time with it. Oh, as always, beautiful presentation. Um, you know, fun, clever gameplay. Uh, you know, a, a game that makes roll and move actually fun. Is That's a big, big accomplishment for my number 12, Natillion. Then we have number 11, Port Royal, The Adventure Begins. Now, this came out last year, I think? Might have even been two years ago, from Alexander Pfister. And it is another example of Mr. Pfister um, trying to weave narrative story campaign elements into what would otherwise be drawing, boring, just another Soulless Heroes style games. Uh, the original Port Royal was a very, very sharp push your luck. Um, game where you you uh, keep drawing cards from a deck. You have a danger if you draw too many of them of busting, but you need to draw enough to get what you really want. And then other players get the opportunity to take stuff that you didn't take. Always been a good sharp game. <clears throat> the uh, new game, though, uh, is really impressive because uh, it adds a, a bunch of... You know, or, I'm sorry, not the new game. The expansion adds a uh, new, uh, you know, a whole new type of pirate ship. Uh, the concept of ships that can be taken for their money or give you other things if you fight off the pirates, or, or, or I guess I should say if you parlay with the pirates instead of fighting them off. And, um, you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, new uh, people you can recruit that have different special powers. A lot of really cool stuff. But all these things are drip-fed to you through a multi-story campaign. And that campaign is driven by an event system where every time you play, because uh, you can, like before, uh, play cooperatively or competitively. Uh, if you have to solve, if you play cooperatively or solo, a series of specific events before time runs out. Uh, and um, and that can be very challenging, and the events tell a little story. Now, like I said before, this is not going to be, you know, uh, winning Alexander Pfister the Pulitzer Prize for, uh, for fiction. I mean, they're just simple little stories, but they don't have to be big, elaborate things. They're just something that makes repeated play of a really wonderful Euro a more fun and engaging narrative experience. As you see, well, who is that mysterious person? And what does it mean? And and you know, what actually happened to the, to the person I'm trying to save when I failed to save them? And this and that and the other. Really nice, fun stuff. But yeah, there are story beats you've seen a million times before, but you haven't seen them in a game like this. And it just elevates the overall experience. And I had a great time. The... Uh, the the, the event system works really, really nicely, where over the course of a given session, more and more events start piling up. If you haven't completed a given event by a certain time, then either a good one or a bad one will be the next event you have to deal with while still solving the original one. So you have a lot of flexibility about how to go. It's nice and challenging, but not too challenging. I had a great time playing solo. It works so well. It just barely missed my number 10. That's my number 11, Port Royal, The Adventure Begins. And now let's talk about number 10, uh, Cosmic Run Express. Now, this is a game I have a prototype of 
because it's going to be going on Kickstarter uh, next month, in the month of August, from Dr. Uh, Steve Finn, uh, or Dr. Finn Games. And uh, yeah, this is really shop. This is this must be his fourth or his fifth game in the Cosmic Run series. And oh, by the way, I should say, folks, I was not paid for this particular one. Um, I was, uh, you know, Dice Throne Adventures was a paid preview. And let's see... So far, nothing else has been. Cosmic Run Express, even though this is for a Kickstarter game, uh, it's just such a fun little trifle. You know, you said, I, you know, I, I, I agreed to do it without charging anything. So I'm only going to talk about it here. I'm not going to be doing a full run through for it. But I can say it's as sharp as the Cosmic Run series has ever been. In fact, it's really interesting. It's a two player, it's a one or two player game. So it's a, a dually game. And um, it plays radically different. I haven't played it as a multiplayer game, but I'd like to try it. In that game, it, you, you start out every round with a draft where I've got six cards. I give you two, you give me two. And uh, and then that, I'm going to use these cards to race towards one of three planets. To you know, And you know, the sooner I get to the planet, you know, first player to planet gets the points of the planet. And we're dueling to try and get to the planets. Um, the interesting thing is, these cards are basically, I forget what the scale is, like 1 to 4, 1 to 6. They're, they're basically all numbers. And so I give you a 2 and a 3. I know you've got a 2 and a 3. Because after we've done this, one round of drafting, we are going to go through several rounds of, um, you know, pick a card, reveal at the same time on a given planet. And I hope if I went for my low value card, it was on a planet you weren't going to go on. Because you went over there and I could use my low value card and still get a win here because you wouldn't beat me. Um, if, or if I use a high value card, I better use it at a place I expect you're going to go so I can... So that's cool in and of itself. Simultaneous action selection on this little racing thing. Um, I, I haven't played it, but I suspect it'll work really well because Dr. Finn's games always work really well. Fun, simple, fast little filler, you know, 10, 15 minute uh, game with Cosmic Run. I played it solo though, and I was really impressed by it because they dropped the drafting thing because you don't have another human being to draft against. You don't have somebody to get into the mind of. And instead, he effectively creates a solo version of Biblios. And that's a big deal, because Biblios is still his greatest game of all time. What happens instead now is, at any given time, I have a, you know, a hand of cards, and on my turn, I will uh, play a card for myself or for my opponent. And so, obviously, I want to play low-value cards for my opponent and high-value cards for myself so that I will beat my opponent to every... Uh, planet. And again, it's like Biblios. So I keep a card for myself. I put a card in the pool for everybody. You know, that, 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 that kind of thing. So I, so, but I always have this tough choice. Do I use this one for myself? Uh, it'll up my chances. Or, because here's the thing I didn't mention. When you're playing cards, there's the value. Whoever has the highest value for a given planet gets closer to it. But there's also colors. And um, if you match the color to the planet you're trying to go to, and those colors shift over the course of the game, you get bonus movement for free. So, if I don't think um, I can beat him, or I, you know, I, I know I can't beat him, I could at least still try to get those color bonuses. And it was really, really sharp. Uh, because um, you, you basically go through two rounds. I, I, I play a bunch of level ones, and I'm trying to go for those color... I, I play the first round for both me and the, uh, the virtual opponent, and I'm just trying to get those color bonuses. And then I got the second round, and I can see what was played for the first round, and it's the first and the second round that gets added together to determine who actually gets the big bonus for getting to the planet. It's sharp. I was really impressed. I was grinning from ear to ear as I was playing it. Really beautiful idea. And it so harkens back to Biblios. If you love Biblios and you always thought, man, I wish I could play that solo, you kind of can now with Cosmic Run Express, which, like I said, is going to be coming on Kickstarter in a, and it's only going to be running for a week. It's just like a, a quick little tiny filler um, campaign for a quick little tiny filler of a game. And yet, I really enjoyed it playing here all by my lonesome Cosmic Run Express. But, but, but... Folks, the Cosmic Run Express was not alone because I totally missed out on the fact, uh, when I recorded this earlier today, that Steve Finn also sent me a little mini expansion for Cosmic Run Rapid Fire. And this is so clever and cool. Just a small little deck of 10 cards that are two-sided, and you lay them out to create five new objectives for yourself while you're playing Rapid Fire, and then you put the other five cards uh, face down so that there is a unique unique reward associated with each of the objectives. Then players just race to complete those objectives first to get those bonuses they can use whenever they want. And of course, it works really well in the solo game and Cosmic Run Rapid Fire is a very good solo game. So. Uh, since this is coming late, I don't want to have to refilm everything to figure out where this sits in the overall rankings. So I'm just going to say that this was number 10 and a half. This was the half a game um, that I didn't even realize I was going to talk about when I set out filming this morning. And so, 
Keep an eye out for this Kickstarter campaign that's coming in August. If you like Cosmic Run, there is some great love for Rapid Fire and the very cool new Express. Then we've got number nine, Feast for Odin, Norwegian's expansion. And uh, this is really interesting. I'm really so glad I got to play it because after we played the original Feast for Odin, we thought it was brilliant, maybe one of Uwe's best, but we got rid of it because we were very unhappy with a few certain things, the way randomness works on the, on the uh, occupation draw and the weapon draw. We just were so unhappy with that that we ultimately didn't keep it. Um, so... Imagine my surprise when I discover the Norwegian expansion totally fixes it in a really brilliant design way. So much more clever than anything I ever would have thought of myself, and I was so impressed that it gave us, it kind of gave us back Feast for Odin. Now, I've only played it solo. Uh, I'm waiting for Jen to get back so we can play with her because I know she's going to love it just as much as me. And so, yeah, Feast for Odin was always a ma uh, magnificent, one of Uwe Rosenberg's best worker placements ever, and that's saying something. But now, Norwegians just takes it through the stratosphere, makes it so much better in a million different ways. Um, but, since I did it by myself, I also got a chance to play Feast for Odin solo, which I had never done before. And, wow! It's a great solo game. I can see why there is such a huge and rabid fan base for Feast for Odin solo gaming. I mean, if you go on Board Game Geek, you can see dozens and dozens of people talking at great length, really drilling down into this game as a solo experience. And, uh, you know, the solo game is maybe almost, for, I'm sure some people would consider, even more Im strongly impacted in a positive way than the multiplayer game ever was. Now, that said, as impressed as I was, I mean, this didn't make it into the top five. It's at number eight, solely because I was a little disappointed. You can play Feast for Odin with the long or the short game, and it's pretty obvious from the presentation of this that the long game, which is not Jen's and my preferred way to play, is where the lion's share of the development and tweaking and, and balancing was put. In fact, if you play the short game, there's um, some questions as to how some things actually work, because they only describe how they work in the long game. Again, I talked about all that in my video I did for it, so you can go learn, learn more there. But regardless of that, it's a pretty minor complaint, because Feast for Odin Norwegians, oh yeah, baby. My only complaint now is, I gotta find room on my shelf for Nor Feast for Odin, which is a problem, because it's a big box. But yeah, Norwegians expansion, amazing, game-changing in the biggest, bestest way possible. All right. Then, let's move on to number eight. A solo-only game from Renegade Games and designer Kane Klenko called Proving Grounds. And now, this is a really interesting game. It is a real-time dice-rolling game where I am a hero. I find myself in an arena surrounded by lots of big, terrible gladiators and guards who are trying to take me out. And um, when the timer starts... You don't need a smartphone app, but they do make an app that's really nice. has a lot of really good ambience and sound effects and stuff like that. But you can just use an egg timer or anything. If I recall, you get two minutes to roll and roll and roll as fast as you can and try to decide how to assign those dice because you're surrounded by all these different gladiators. Um, and if you, if you roll twos, you can assign them to the uh, gladiator in the number two spot. If you roll fives, you can assign it to the gladiator in the five spot. And um, and if you... But I don't want to assign... The gladiator in the two spot is not a danger to me right now. i got to fight this guy in the five because he's really going to work me over. I didn't roll any fives. Well, then re-roll as much as you want to try to get what you need. But here's the trick. you If you have a single, uh, you know, if I roll my dice and I want to get fives and I didn't get any fives, um, I can't just roll any dice I want. I can only roll dice that I have multiples of. So if I have three threes, I could re-roll that group of three threes and try to get some fives. Because I don't need to fight the guy at three, I need to fight the guy at five. So okay, I, you know, and this is all high pressure stuff. I'll, I'll grab the threes and I'll re-roll them. I didn't get any fives. And ah, now I, I ended up getting a bunch of singles. So those are useless to me. All right, well, I've still got two fours. I'll try to roll them. Yes, I got a five. Okay, I put that over there. And I got another two. I can combine it with this other two. And now I've got a pair of twos that don't do me any good because I don't care about that guy. I'll re-roll them. Yes, I got another five. And I got a one. I can combine it with a one. This is a cool puzzle. It's uh, it's really simple. And like always with a real-time game, if, you, if it wasn't for the real time, you could just spend your time very carefully thinking about what the probabilities are as you're going to roll and where should you assign your resources and all that. But with the timer counting down, especially if you get the app and so you've got like the sounds of combat and the music and all that, uh, it really, I mean, you just don't have much time and it's very, very challenging. And 
So that's the core of it, but uh, there are special player powers you can earn, and um, you know, much like an Oniverse game, actually, a lot of different modules you can turn on or off, like chariots that are in the uh, environment, and um, you know, the audience that's watching gets involved as patrons and stuff like that. So there's a lot of really cool things. This game has, you know, just the base game is very sharp, but when you start adding some of these modules, it gets really good. Now I'll be honest, I liked it a lot. What is it? It's my it's my number eight. It's really really good. It makes me so sad that they didn't do the work to make this a cooperative game because I so want to share this game with Jen. Now, what they should have done, I think, is, hey, um, as a, if you buy a single copy, it's a solo game, but you can buy an extra copy, and now it can be a cooperative game where I'm fighting all of my... Whatchamacallit, all of, all of my people that are attacking me, you meanwhile are rolling your own dice from your copy of the game, and they're attacking you, and there's just some method by which, oh, I need fives, I can never get fives, and you hand me some of your fives, and I, or we do a trade or something like that. They could have done something like that to make this uh, just as um, uh, valid a cooperative experience, and I think that would have been amazing. I'm really kind of bummed they didn't, because I, I had a fun time playing it. Um, and... I, I can only ever play it solo. But if you're looking for a fun, solo, real-time, dice-rolling, uh, action-packed, uh, puzzly adventure, you uh, you might want to check out Proving Grounds. Number eight. Then, let's talk about number seven. Oh, hold on there. Before we move on to number seven, one more thing about Proving Grounds. It turns out if you have the first edition of the game, there was a major major error in the production. The stats on all the gladiators you fight are totally wonky and make the game almost impossible to beat. Now, the publisher has uh, made it an option to contact them and have a full set of replacement cards sent free of charge anywhere in the world, I believe. You can go to Renegade's website to learn more about that. And uh, it is a real shame because otherwise it's such a sharp game. If you do end up getting the copy and are waiting for your updated corrected cards to show up, just to have some chance of winning, I would suggest playing with the Dragon and the Inspiration Powers modules turned on to give you a, just a little bit more of a chance to beat the almost impossible odds. And then just wait patiently for your replacement cards to show up. It's a real shame, uh, a little bit of a black eye in otherwise stellar production for Proving Grounds. Then, let's talk about number seven. Walking in Burano. Now, this is a card drafting game where we're trying to grab cards that represent the ground floor, second floor, and third floor, or first floor and second floor, depending on where uh, you are in the world, to make the beautiful painted uh, facades, building fronts, of the, uh, the, the Venetian suburb of Burano. And, I mean, Burano is a beautiful place. Jen and I have actually been there in real life. And uh, this is a beautiful little game. It's a very sharp, fun, puzzly problem to solve. Because I can't just draft one card from the common supply. I have to... Well, I can. But basically, all the cards I can draft are in these columns. And I just can't grab a card in the middle of the column if that's the one I need. If I have a, see a card in the middle of a column I want, I have to take either the top or the bottom and then get to the middle. So you're kind of restricted, but kind of not in what you can do. And then once you get these cards, you have to start building buildings. But, like real world Burano, you have to make sure all the colors match. And so often, there'll be the perfect piece you need, but you have to take another piece that's useless to you to get that perfect piece you need because you have to pay attention to other tile laying rules. And it's sharp. It's fun. It's pretty. Every time you play, you're going to get a different combination of scoring opportunities, so you're trying to achieve different things. And uh, yeah, it's a good, good solo game. This is another one where I just cannot wait for Jen to get back, because I, I suspect it'll be even better when I'm not drafting uh, against just an automated opponent who just, you know, as part of the course of the game, just automatically pulls stuff out and, you know, maybe prevents me from doing what I need to do. But even still, the puzzle was so good solo, it was my number seven. I can't wait to play it with Jen. Uh, walking in Burano. Then, on to number six. Now, this is another paid preview on Kickstarter, so pay, uh, bear that in mind. Uh, what am I talking about? Ether Fields. Now, this is interesting. It's, a, it's my second dreamscape game, uh, because Oniverse is in this crazy dreamscape. Ether Fields is in this crazy, surreal, phantasmagorical dreamscape as well. But this is, this is a dark dreamscape. This is a, uh, a Tim Burton Nightmare of Halloween 
or uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, um, uh, Greenscape. And by, by that I mean it's 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 dark and it's gothic and it's evocative and it's sometimes very serious and sinister and creepy, but it's sometimes just really silly and offbeat. Um, as you travel this dream world, having no idea who you are, where you came from, why you're here, what's going on, trying to unlock the mystery of you in this world. What is this world? Who am I? What's going on? And um, dealing with a series of very uh, intriguing and evocative obstacles because uh, this is a deep and rich narrative-driven game where you go through a series of campaign chapters as you get one step closer to discovering who you are and what's going on in the ether fields. Now, all of this is driven by a very sharp hand management game where uh, you have multi-use cards that you can use for icons that are on them or you can use them for special powers and... Uh, the deck you're drawing from to use all these special use cards, uh, it's its a deck building game, so you're constantly making yourself stronger in this world by throwing more stuff in, uh, and you really need to be very, very sharp about how you go about overcoming all the obstacles that this dream world will throw at you. I almost don't want to go into any more depth because the game is so surprising. Such a weird mix of, 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 of content. It's really impressive. And uh, yeah, it's from the uh, Michael... Orash, the designer of This War of Mine. This is from the publisher-designer of This War of Mine. So it has great production values. It has It's an incredibly evocative and rich narrative-driven game and really sharp gameplay, too. I was really blown away by it. I think the Kickstarter hasn't ended yet, if you want to go check out my run-through and learn a little bit more. And so that was a revisit of my paid preview for my number six game of the month, which I've only played solo. I wish I could play it with Jen. I think she'll be okay with it. That it might be a little bit too dark for her and twisted, but I think she would enjoy it. And I can definitely see how cooperative play would be even better than solo play in Etherfields. Then we move on to number five, Imperial Settlers Roll and Write. Now, this is, I mean, uh, this is Imperial Settlers, the Roll and Write, uh, which means you are basically a harvesting resource build up buildings to score lots of points in your little Imperial settlement. And the interesting thing is, before Jen left, I did play it with her as a multiplayer game. And I'll be honest, Jen and I were not impressed. We thought, it's okay. It's, it's almost like, I kind of liken it to, you know how sometimes games come with like a tutorial? And you're supposed to play the tutorial, and you're like, okay, I know this isn't the full game, but I'm just playing this to learn the basics. Now I'll play the real game, and you'll turn everything on. It feels like the multiplayer version of this is a tutorial that you never get out of, because there's just not enough there. You can see, oh, this is interesting, but yeah, I don't want to play this a dozen times, because there's, there's not enough meat on the bone. Here's the weird thing about Imperial Settlers Roll and Write. It comes with two pads of paper. The competitive pad of paper, where you just have the... the, the, the everybody gets a sheet that takes you through a very simple in dice rolling, uh, or I'm sorry, not dice rolling, dice drafting engine building game that you roll and write. Works okay, just kind of uh, not enough boom to, to really pull us in. The other sheet, the other deck of sheets are solo um, sheets that you can, so you can only play them in the solo game, and every one of them, all 48, are a different configurations of buildings you can build. So every time you play this game solo, you get a totally new experience. Um, and even if you play a given sheet once or twice, these sheets are so much more interesting with so many more cool, powerful effects than what you see in the competitive game that you could play a given sheet multiple times and, and choose different strategies and stuff like that. And I was really impressed. This is a great solo roll and write and just kind of a meh multiplayer roll and write, which... Uh, is weird. Normally, if anything, you expect it to be the other way around. But clearly, they put a lot more love and attention into the solo game. And so, it ranks super high. Um, it would be... It would be up there at number 19 with Talos and Legendary Tales if I were comp if I were rating this as a multiplayer game. Because it's just... Uh, it just doesn't have legs. But the solo game does. And so I played it several times uh, and had a really great time. You can see why in the run-through I did. Now, the interesting thing is, as an update to that run-through, because I didn't know it at the time, the um, developers at Portal, uh, Ignacy Trevcek, have, since releasing the original game, have put out new rules variants that will allow you to use the solo sheets in a multiplayer scenario. And like, what? Why didn't you ship like that? 
Um, so I'm glad to set the record. I haven't tried it yet, but I suspect the way they've implemented it, it'll work really nicely. And suddenly, um, Imperial Settlers Roll and Write can go from zero to hero for a multiplayer game as well by using all those amazing solo assets that it comes with. But in the meantime, since I haven't tried that with Jen, I can say um, with high confidence that as a solo game, Imperial Settlers Roll and Write is the bee's knees, and it's my number five. Then we go on to number four, Sierra West which is a great uh, American uh, frontier settlement game. It's uh, action programming, where every turn you get uh, three cards, and the cards have a million different icons on them in different orders and whatnot. And the way you slot these cards into your own player board covers up some of those icons, leaving only certain ones revealed. And that ends up creating basically kind of like a programming language, a program that you will then run. Um, because you take your little, you actually have two little frontier meeples, and you run them along the top and the bottom programming line that indicates all the things you'll do in a given round. Harvest resources, turn those resources into other resources, build things, um, you know, you know, go journeying, etc., etc. And that central puzzle, if I got these three cards, and there's a dozen different ways I could put these things together to create a different set of actions that I'm actually going to do over the course of the round, is brilliant, and I absolutely love it. So, I've only played it solo. How is it as a solo game? It's brilliant, and I absolutely love it. The base game is designed by Johnny Pack. Watch Johnny Pack. He is an up-and-coming designer. Um, this, this programming thing is so brilliant. The solo rules were designed by Dave Turchy. Watch Dave Turchy. He is an up-and-coming designer. Because, uh, basically, there is a deck that um, the uh, your, com your, co your competition run that determines what they're going to do every round. And during your turn, while you're doing all your programming and deciding what you're going to do, you can see the top of the enemy deck. And you can see, oh, these are four actions he might do. I don't know. He's going to do three of those four actions. I don't know which one he's not going to do. After I've done everything, then I flip the card and that reveals, right, oh, he did those three actions. I thought he was going to do the other action, which informed what I was going to do because I had to get to him, and he didn't do that. It really, it's such a brilliant idea. So simple, so elegant, but really makes you feel like you're playing against a, a thinking human being who surprises you and zigs when you expect them to zag. I am super impressed by the multiplayer, although I haven't played it that way. Again, Jen, come home! But the solo uh, um, is brilliant. It's my number four, Sierra West. Then, number three is Sagrada Passion. Actually, that's not the full title. But uh, that's the important thing. Uh, if you do a search for Sagrada Passion, you'll on Board Game Geek, you'll find it. Uh, um, sorry, I don't remember the full title. It's right there on the top of the screen, too. Anyway, um, because it's the first of a series of expansions for Sagrada, which, when I played it a million years ago and did a run-through for it, Jen and I, we were both very impressed. We liked it a lot. A wonderful, puzzly, dice-drafting game where you literally puzzle the dice you get together to make beautiful pieces of stained glass. It was a sharp game. And the only problem we had with it is it came out right around the same time as Role Player, which did very, very similar things, but at a much heavier, deeper game. Sagrada is a wonderful gateway game. You could teach it to anybody and have a great time playing. Um, I almost talked my mom into playing Sagrada with me this month with Jen gone, because I think she could have handled it. Um, and because of that, we opted to go or to invest our love and attention to Role Player because it was a deeper, heavier game. And Sagrada, well, all right, I got you. there could be only one. Here's the thing, with this new Passion expansion, so much, three cool new modules, special um, superpower dice you can get, and oh, um, oh, a unique special powers players have got, and then a whole bunch of new types of objectives, public objectives we can go for. All three of these things thrown into the game really enriches it, makes it much, much deeper and more compelling, and really elevates the game to where it is near, you know, on a toe-to-toe -to -toe basis with role player in terms of deep, engaging gameplay, while still driven by such a simple core dice draft and, and puzzle together thing. I'm very impressed by it. Now, I have one problem. This is not the first time I've complained about this. The solo rules for Sagrada Passion, if you pick up a copy of Sagrada Passion and you read through the rules, you'll find there's no reference to the solo rules at all. They were completely ignored! And so, it's funny, originally I actually was going to have this rated much, much higher, like some of the other ones, where it's just like, okay, they clearly didn't put the work in. Uh, you know, I played it anyway and just kind of made up my own rules, and I was like, wow, this is amazing! I can't wait for Jen! I wish they would have included the solo rules. Well, just this morning, I heard back 
from the publisher, and um, you know they're about to release the solo rules, which they weren't quite ready in time for their press um, and all that. So they're about to release them. He sent me a rough and ready version, and literally right before I filmed this, I played a quick game of Sagrada Passion with the solo rules, and folks, they're fantastic. They so improve the solo game because they bring the favor glass baubles back in. And now you use them again, which solves the number one problem with the solo game from the original, which was there was this fundamental schism between the difficulty of the um, of the objective cards you would take, which was offset by being able to take the uh, favor tokens. But then in the solo game, you don't use the favor tokens. And the whole thing just got kind of completely cattywampus in terms of difficulty scaling and all that. It's fair now with passions because they get brought back in and it's wonderful. Oh yeah, baby. I've only played it once, but I was super impressed. I was already impressed anyway. And Sagrada Passion, I'm very passionate about it now. So that's number three. Let's move on to number two, Arion. This is the other Oniverse game. And um, this one, I, I have to say, I've played it uh, several times now, only solo, not co-op, but it is the best Shady Torby Oniverse game ever. It is, again, set in the Oniverse, crazy, surreal, dream world. This is uh, Shady Torby's take on Yahtzee. And it is so good. A brilliant kind of push-your-luck game of uh, building crazy airship contraptions. And, like always, there's a whole bunch of different modules you can add in. And unlike Natillion before, uh, you don't want to throw all of them in. It'd be way too much. But adding two or three of them and mixing and matching, oh, it's just beautiful. So tense. So exciting. Great, great solo play. I haven't played it uh, cooperative yet, but like always, I'm sure it'll be great. But, ah, I'm just blown away. It is literally the greatest Oniverse game ever, as far as I'm concerned. I played them all except for Urbion, because that one never got part of the new Oniverse series. So someday I need to play that too. But, yeah. I'm over the moon uh, with Arion. Just beautiful. Again, oh, I wish my wife were here to, to share it with me because I, I suspect the uh, co-op rules, from what I've read, they sound really, really good. But if you want to know more about it, go check out my run-through. That was number two, Arion, but the number one best game of the month. And I'm going to call it, folks, Babe Ruth style. Best game of the year. We'll wait till December and the following April to see if that's true. But right now, I'm pretty confident Black Angel will probably be my number one game of the year. Oh, that's a bit presumptuous to say. You never know what's coming. But I know what's here, and Black Angel is amazing. The spiritual successor to Twa. It builds on Twa and does so many cool, amazing new things. Go watch my run-through. It's like uh, almost two hours long, all told, because I just could not stop playing. I I'll tell you, folks, I may look... Like a really bubbly and upbeat, and, oh, I'm just having a really fun time. But um, it's rare, very, very rare, that uh, I want to keep playing after the run through is over. Twa, I definitely want to. It's a brilliant uh, solo rule uh, introduction. You know, kind of a similar, maybe not as good as the Sierra West one, where you can see what they're going to do, but you just don't know which one they're not going to do. Here, it's a thing where. Uh, you draw a card, they're, they're either going to do uh, uh, action A or action B based on what I did on my turn, and that's enough to create an opponent who is very, very... Oh, he's confounding. It's like, it feels like you're playing against a human player who surprises you, like, oh, I can't believe you did that right now! I was about to do it next turn, you took it! Ah! Type stuff. It's just great. Um, oh, man. I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, because you can go watch... I think... I, didn't I talk... In my final thoughts, I think for like over a half an hour about all the million ways this thing is just one of the best games I've played in years. Um, and I suspect I suspect it might make my top 10 games of all time. I, I, I hate to blow it up really big, folks, but this is amazing. Um, I, now, to be fair, I'm basing all of this off of my, what is it, I think half a dozen solo plays I've played of it. I have not even played this as a multiplayer game yet, so I still need to see how it's going to feel at Gen. I did play it as a multiplayer game a few months ago with uh, uh, W. Eric Martin of Board Game Geek, to be fair. But, I, you know, we actually, he got a major rule wrong, so the game was a little bit wonky, so I'm kind of dismissing that. I can't wait for Jen to get back next month to play it, but yeah, as a solo game, I was blown away. Uh, you know, with this game of dice drafting as we try to shepherd the last ship of humanity to a new planet to repopulate based on our DNA, uh, because we've all been wiped out. Uh, but the AI that runs the ship, they don't necessarily agree on the best way to go about things. And so we're all competing to be the supreme AI. Uh, you know, reprogramming ourselves, going on missions to nearby planets, uh, drafting dice, uh, um, 
everything about this game, oh, it's just, it's just near perfection. My one complaint that I have so far, and I wouldn't even have this complaint if I hadn't played Twa. There's one thing I missed from Twa, which I did mention in my video, is some of the more crazy, far out uh, special card effects. Um, that's the uh, really the one thing. All the card effects for the missions you can do and the programming upgrades you can do are all pretty simple and straightforward. They're all just generate goods or convert those goods into other goods or, or points, more to the point. And um, when I remember back to all the cool powers you got in Twa, there were some really far out things and I really miss those. But all that means is Black Angel is near perfection. And all it's waiting for, for true perfection, is an expansion with some new cards. And the interesting thing is, one of the developers did post on BoardGameGeek, yeah, we developed a whole bunch of cards, all kinds of crazy, far-out, cool, special powers and whatnot. And he didn't say this, but my assumption is, they just decided to hold those back because the game is so big and rich and challenging, they didn't want to throw people into the deep end of the game. And so they're probably saving all that really amazeball stuff for an expansion. Fingers crossed! Um, but even still, even without that, Black Angel is my number one game of the month. By far. By a mile. And that's it, folks. We are done with another roundup. Thanks again uh, for uh, sticking with me, and uh, I'll see you again in another four weeks. But uh, my solo days will be over, I'm afraid, since Jen will finally be back, and we'll get to have some fun. Thanks for watching, everybody. As always, have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye, bye, bye.